Good afternoon, everybody. I'm, Bobby. I'm Jonathan from the Association of Malaysia. I'm the current secretary. I'm also a corporate partner with Zaid Ibrahim and uh, I oversee the fintech portfolio. Uh, so with me this afternoon or this noon, I have um, Salim, CEO of Pay. I have Mayin, Green Packet, and Farah from IPFC Love One. So it's quite an interesting mix that, that we're going to be talking about the impact of uh, digital banking to the industry. And um, I guess before I, I kickstart, maybe I can have a uh, go around and have each of you introduce yourself a little bit, starting with Salim, uh, Mayin, and then uh, Farah. Uh, Salim Danani, uh, CEO and founder of uh, BigPay. Um, we started this company uh, in 2017. Uh, we launched in 2018, and, and the intention was to create a digital neobank uh, across Southeast Asia, with Malaysia as the launch pad. Um, so we're really, it's really our engagement tool, um, and our intention is to grow that out across the region um, uh, with different products as well as different markets. So when it comes to product lines, uh, we've launched businesses, we're launching lending in, a, in about a month and a half, and um, the, the, the next step for us is to invest in this uh, track as well. Thank you, Jonathan. Hello, everyone. Afternoon. My name is Mei Yin. So um, I head the consumer and SME fintech division from Kippel. Um, so Kippel in Malaysia, we're very different from the other e-wallet players that have gone to target the masses. Um, so people played in niches from the start. So we're always looking at serving one communities at a time via B two B two C model. Um, our transform transformative purpose is to add financial inclusivity, impacting every Malaysians, um, and we do it our way of looking at each niche communities and making and turning them into a cashless ecosystem yeah, from a digital and fintech perspective. Nice to meet everyone online. Hi, uh, I'm Farah. Thank you, Jonathan, for this opportunity. Thank you, fellow panelists that I've not met before till today. I've not had the pleasure, clearly. Um, I represent uh, the Labuan Financial Services Authority, the Labuan Internal Business and Financial Center. And my role is really to develop the jurisdiction, market the jurisdiction, and try and get our message out there as uh, far and wide as possible. Uh, so we are Malaysia's uh, mid shoulder um, and we are extremely digital friendly. We don't believe in sandboxes necessarily. The ethos is that um, digital is not, um, digital is just an alternative way of processing uh, whether it be financial, non-financial business processes. Um, and that ethos has really taken us quite far. So yeah, um, I look forward to sharing a bit more with you soon. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, great. Thanks, thanks everyone. Um, so yeah, let's just kick start with our final session today on the impact of digital bank to the industry. So that, so I guess for the past two years, there's lots of hype when it comes to this digital banking space, right? We 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 had the lights of players like Monzo, players like Starling in, in, in the forefront, and, and that was on the European um, European side of things, the the, the the Western side of the continent. Um, but then back here in Asia Pacific, we have WeChat, WeChat Bank, that was, that was quite um, robust as well. Then it started to trickle down to Southeast Asia, and then we have uh, HKMA coming out with their own digital bank. Um, guidelines. Of course, MES was following suit, and I remember those days. I think together with Farah, we were talking a lot about digital bank initiatives in Malaysia. But this two terms seems to create some confusion these days. Digitizing a bank and a digital bank seems to be catching up in our Malaysian lingua, but somehow or rather, I don't think the entire community is is very clear about what's the difference between digitizing a bank and a digital. Bank. Yeah, maybe I can have the two him players to, to just share a bit of insight. Sure, I'll take that and run with it. So um, digital banking licenses. So, so I guess it's a great PR tool um, as well as a way to, um, uh, you know, show and actually look, I think there's a balance, right? I think as a regulator and, and for I, I run the risk of uh, you know, perhaps, you know, boxing all regulators as one. And I know LBFC is actually quite innovative in what they're doing as well. But like, I mean, if you look at these regulators, like, you know, showing that you are willing to, you know, foster innovation. And at the same time, you need to have, you do need to still keep a handle as a regulator on, you know, uh, on the core tenets of your responsibility. 
right, of like having of securing the financial system. And the digital banking licenses are one way to do that, right? I think what have what what you were getting in with HKMA was a whole bunch of lenders, you know, originating. You don't really you've got tier two capital like flying around everywhere. You don't really know where the money's coming from and who's where, where, where the where ownership lies at the very end. And and then you also want to be able to create a space where that capital is being regulated by the actual regulator itself. And I think we've seen that trickled down into Singapore. And I think that you have different ideas, you know, in terms of it, it was really in, it was telling when you saw MAS have uh, consumer licenses and trade licenses or, or wholesale licenses. And that was very, very interesting in terms of how MAS sees the role of digital banks across the region. And, and, and you know, and Singapore is always one of the, you know, one of the countries that's, that's Choose my words carefully here. Um, that 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 that's that's uh, wanted to have a an, an influence across across the whole region, right? And so I think the digital banking is an extension of that of that foreign policy. And I think that I think I, I'll, I'll digress just one second and say that digital banks and banking regulations are political. Um, and as we go into Malaysia, I think Bank Negara, you know, is also trying to foster innovation. We've seen this on a multiple, or no, on a number of different fronts, whether it be EKYC, you know, uh, you know, civilization, whether you look at the e-money licenses that have been given out. I mean, it's better to have 40, you know, e-money licenses than have two, right? And this is the argument I would say. I mean, yes, I don't think they're all <laughs> efficient, but at least it's good to have, at least it's good to have more. Um, going back to your question, um, I think that digital banking licenses are, will create innovation naturally. Um, will all five or all, you know, in any market survive or eight in Hong Kong, you know, whatever they are in Hong Kong. Like, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I think some will face the calamities that we've seen in, in, in Europe and then also in, in Australia. Um, but fundamentally, the ones that understand why they're going for a license will win. Um, and that comes down to understanding, you know, the efficiency that can be gained with the bank when you are at the right size and having the right cap table, having the shareholders, that understand that vision as well. And it's not just about calling yourself a bank, but actually becoming one. Um, I think those guys will win. So, and building it from the ground up is different than digitizing a bank. Not to say it can't be done. It's not just a tech stack, it is culture. It is understanding that you are tech led and every and, and, and really debating those, comp, you know, those, those decisions whilst having the right governance. And for me to say that FinTechs have found the right balance, I can't say that, I don't know. I think we'll, we'll, we'll see. The proof will be in the pudding. Yeah, so Jonathan, maybe I'll add my point of view on that as well. Um, I think why it's confusing um, for both digital banks and digitalization of the banks, it's because uh, both actually to use technology to lower barrier for customers to access financial services. So if you do that on a digital layer and technology layer, it looks like it's the same. But if you look very deep into how both serve individuals and businesses, you'll see that the difference comes up very clear in three areas. Um, the first is in profiling the users, the end users. Number two is the way um, the end users interact with a digital bank via a digital bank or a bank who is digitalizing. And the third is services, right? So if you look at Bank Nagar's uh, guidelines, um, a digital bank is meant to serve unbanked, underserved in terms of a bank and underpenetrated, right? So um, if we look at point number one, profiling, while um, a, a bank may look at ways to onboard a customer a lot more differently so that they can do why uh, to get to the customers the widest and quickest way possible. Um, so they use digitally generated methods, you know, apps and web apps to onboard customers. Um, a virtual uh, digital bank need to shift from reach to relevance, because these customers are very different, right? So I give an example, um, SME financing. It's gonna, look, it's gonna look a lot more different between a bank who is digitalizing and a digital bank. Um, a lot of the SMEs that a virtual bank would serve would have very little, let's say, documentation at the start. So the banks look at them as a risky um, segment, uh, but the digital bank actually would need to look at non-bank data right, to assess risk and relevance to serve these SMEs in terms of financing. Um, so digital banks need to look at um, traces, digital information that these SMEs leave in other platforms rather than banks. They look at SME subscription services, their day-to-day -day, uh, 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 
tools that they use, like accounting, payment gateway, online, e-wallet, right? They look at all these data, study these data, um, so that they can predict what these SME want to do. How do I help them grow and scale? And then form that offer that's relevant to them, right? And then we move from um, interacting in a different way to these SMEs. We don't look at um, launching an, a bank app or doing a, a web-based digital loan. It looks at channel transformation to moments of truth. It looks at these data so that I can target the SMEs at the right time the right frequency, the right messaging at the channel that they are, are in at that moment, right? Um, and I think the last point that differs a uh, 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 digitalization of a bank and a digital bank, it's in the products. Uh, banks look at uh, banking products. Digital bank looks at microservices, right? So we don't look at loans as a digital loan product. We look, uh, digital banks look at SME financing as microservices that helps SME get cash, uh, small working capital quickly, because they need the money right now, uh, in a month, in weeks, in, in days, to quickly launch and, and survive in this very tough environment. And while we get the funds in for the, for the SMEs, um, the microservices help the SMEs actually manage their cash better, visualize their cash better. What is the cash in, cash out? How does expenses look? look at that for that and, and help them um, manage their entire business operationally better. So that's actually the difference between a, the bank and a virtual bank from our perspective. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Alim Spain. Now, now that brings me to, to my next um, thought and my next query, right, in a sense. I think, Salim, you, you mentioned it, yeah, HKMA um, looked at it in, in, in a local demographic whereby it was really converging a bunch of lenders in the update, right? And then after that, you have MES looking at um, consumer and wholesale, but again, looking at the demographic and, and the banking system of the sophistication of, of, I guess, financial services in, in Singapore itself, it's a lot more sophisticated than in, in, it is in, in Malaysia um, to, to a very large extent. Um, but, but maybe catering to, to what they are doing, um, it, it may make a lot of sense to have a, a consumer vertical and there's also a consumer uh, a wholesale vertical at the end of the day. But now, I think what main was was very much localizing um, digital banking um, to our local demographics uh, in a sense, and and I, I I like what main just shared in terms of um, it needs to be consumer centric. Um, the way we look at profiling is going to start um, being different, and, and I think that that goes the same for HKM. It goes the same for for MAS uh, at the end of the day. But my concern, maybe or maybe not a concern, um, but maybe thoughts from everybody in a sense whereby with creating this so called um, integration or a little giant that allows to that really would have a payment rail will have a lending rail eventually squeeze out the um, current fintech players whereby you know you create further imposition or, or more stringent regulations that will come in for e-wallet players at this point in time because to a certain extent i guess if, if i hear main correctly um the e-wallet players will have certain data that, that she was mentioning about when it comes to profiling right then you will have also the the ecf voice that again um, we'll have similar data uh, in terms of how we're going to be funding, how we can move forward. With the P2P players also would have a different segment. But introducing a digital bank seems like we're putting everybody under one, one big umbrella. Um, what are your views? Do you think regulation is going to change? Do you think players are going to get squeezed out? Um, how do you look at it in the industry? Yeah. Um, I'll take that just because you, you mentioned my, my earlier comment. So, so uh, I'll start. Um, I think naturally, yes, over time, we will see uh, some level of convergence, especially when it comes to the oversight overseas industries. Uh, but I think it will take time. I think that actually the best way to do it, and I think where regu some regulators do go out better than others, is, is kind of being slightly more laissez-faire uh, in terms of how players and uh, actors launch products and how, how they decide themselves to protect consumers with the regulatory frameworks at hand today. Over-regulating non-bank players like banks or having too much convergence can lead, lead to large issues where you're not actually achieving your goals because it is up to digital banks to perhaps, how do I say, professionalize or, or rather, I should say, you know, kind of capture market share from an efficiency standpoint, but not necessarily be the pioneers. Digital banks, you know, a lot of the people, I mean, if you look at these, look at the applicants or the rumors of applicants, I guess very few are formal at this point. But, you know, a lot of these guys are 
are, are, are existing players and they've already carved out a bit of a niche. So now it's about kind of optimizing the ability to distribute products. And I think, you know, I mean, it's exactly as you said, like, you know, that different mentality has led to the distribution to this particular segment and the digital bank is allowing it for it to be optimized now. Um, to constrain it too much would be to, and having too much convergence relation, and my perspective uh, is that you would actually prevent this cycle happening again, which is not actually what you'd want, right? You'd actually want to continue this. And perhaps the, in the future, these players don't go for digital banking licenses. Maybe there's consolidation. There are other ways by which, uh, you know, bring them into the fold and, and, and you have optimization in the market itself. Yeah, um, so maybe I'll add on to that, Salim and John. Um, I feel for fintechs, banks, digital banks, upcoming, the five that would win a license or eight, right? Um, it generally needs to be all of us working together. Okay, so um, because of these two aspects. So if I go to a bank today, um, as an end user and as an SME, I go to a bank, primarily to serve my long-term financial goals and, and uh, uh, needs, right? So it's a long-term relationship with them. Um, fintechs actually have a much shorter relationship. We are not about that long-term relationship, build your savings. Uh, we are about your short-term financial goals, right? If you're a student, you're an SME, you come to fintechs because you very quickly need to get solution to an imminent cash problem you have. So you come to a fintech. Um, so we fintech serve short-term financial goals. I think a virtual or digital bank, it's kind of in the middle, right? Um, so it is like a fintech because it, it's meant to serve a short-term financial goal. My goal as an SME is to get cash in two weeks. My goal as an individual underserved uh, B40 segment in Malaysia is to get enough eight for me to uh, survive day to day right that's my short-term goal um, but from a digital point of digital bank point of view uh, you need a bit of uh, regulation there because now you're dealing with um, uh, bigger things rather than the fintech apps right so you, you are you are actually now a bank so a digital bank is actually in the middle um, and, but all three of them will continue to serve their uh, very niche, uh, very specific segments on all three fronts, long-term goals, short-term goals, and digital banks serving in between, uh, both on a re regulated environment, but from a short-term financial perspective. So that's mine. Just, Jonathan, just to add to Mayin's bit, right? I mean, yeah, so there, there are different ways to skin a cat, right? And obviously in financial services, uh, you know, everything the panel has talked of uh, about so far is very much customer centric. And this is the way fintechs work and uh, digital, you know, and I love this ethos. But in the real world, right, you're looking at wholesale retail. What we've discussed so far is different verticals within retail. Um, when you talk about HKMA and you talk about mass and you talk about Nagara, there is a domestic element that is involved here. When you talk about a jurisdiction like Labuan, we are completely wholesale. And that's why we're able to be very forward thinking in how we look at stuff. We don't have to necessarily um, be concerned with the domestic sub vertical. So the SME, the B40 and all the rest of it. There is another layering of international global, what I call piping uh, that needs to be digital as well right it's not just about that retail space that we all seem to be fighting over the big money is in that wholesale space right and in that wholesale wholesale space you can be a lot more less fair you can be a lot more open now if you go back to this issue about wallets gateways um all the rest of it those are again right sub verticals of what an entire bank can do now, when you look at an entire bank or bank system, you have to worry about peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, jurisdictional to jurisdictional language. And this is where this issue with regards to the FATF and the VASP comes in, right? And I know a lot of fintechs at the moment are looking at it and going, ah, that's not my space. But you know what? It's going to come back and hit you very quickly because it's hitting us now in wholesale space, right? So we're looking at situations where you have the GDF talking to FATF and APG about the VASP rules and how um, 
how really what they're trying to do is mirror SWIFT. And we all know how efficient SWIFT is. This is exactly what we don't want for this uh, industry, right? The industry needs to be able to stand its ground and um, prove to these uh, supra multilateral uh, regulators that my regulator then adheres to. It, no, we know what's going on within the system. So yeah, it's it the the domestic digital banking license is one thing, but I think the real uh, change is in the wholesale banking system. Right, that 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 actually paves um, my next question. Actually, and, and that specifically goes to you, Farah, in that sense. Whereby I think equally, Lab One has also issued a digital banking guideline, mm -hmm. and, and I think there is a lot or there were some um, media coverage about it, and that some. But the the way media has been covering it has been rather vague as to how this digital yeah. banking license has been yeah coming about. And I, I guess that that goes back to how the um, the, the the similar DEX exchange guidelines was also issued in, in Lab One, and, and I think Lab One is getting enough um, yeah media space in in that sense. So maybe what what I can trouble you is to maybe share a little bit more to us about the difference between the um, current um, the, the licensing framework that Bank Negara has issued. Uh, versus what one has, has recently issued as well. Right. So the the the, the juris, what I call jurisdictional regulators, uh, Nagara, Mas, HKMA, all the rest of it, focus on the jurisdiction. Okay. And this is where I, I just want to, before I go into the license per se, I want to talk about the the ethos, the philosophy behind it, which is very very important to understand. Number one. It is not about the jurisdiction anymore, right? So there is a natural convergence um, between digital, and I don't say fintech, you know, because fintech is that, and digital is everything else, right? So when you look at the digital world and the disrespect, and I use that word very, very loosely, two borders, okay? The uh, inability to control digital technology in a border, whether it be FinTech or Netflix or whatever, is also very clear that, that that pattern is very clear in financial services as well. And this is where mid-show jurisdiction like Labuan comes in very nicely. If you're looking at talk to B40, the domestic SMEs and stuff like that, that's one thing. If you're looking at qualified investors, then a platform like Labuan will allow you access cross-jurisdictionally. Right, that is important to understand. So yes, we have been very forward thinking in uh, how we have looked at the digital space. Okay, and it's been very tough. Personally, it's been very tough for me. I've been in financial services all my life. Moving into this digital space has been mind bending. Okay. Um, we accept that digital processes is an alternative process to box standard processes. We are accept that banking services will evolve the same way everything else will evolve and that digitalization is just an enabler. Now that is the ethos that we have. Based on that, we, and I know the digital banking framework that got that media that you talked about, that press that you got wow. talked about, that was issued in December. But actually by December, we had already licensed, as it stands at the moment, we already have six digital banks, okay? There are two types of banks in Labuan you need to understand. Number one is the commercial banking license. Mm -hmm. These commercial banking licenses are at the moment 50 odd banks, 55 banks in total in Labuan, okay? Which are then divided into two types. Number one, commercial banking license and investment banking license. The commercial banking licenses require you to be already regulated in a competent regu uh, authority in somewhere else in the world and you have access to deposit taking. An investment banking license has no deposit taking access and you don't need to be licensed anywhere else. So a lot of the startups are looking at the investment banking license as a, uh, an avenue to get a digital banking license. And then with regards to mandate or a client deposit, they have a back-to-back -back agreement with another institution, okay? So that really is the difference. I mean, our first, what we got a lot of press about was the fact we. We, in Malaysia, basically, were the first regulator to have licensed a digital bank, i.e. the China Construction Bank, which is the second largest bank in the world. 
Now, the reason that came about even before the guidance was issued, now be, be clear, even before the guidance was issued, was that came about because we had a request from Beijing saying, and I mean, at, at that time, it was maybe two years ago now, um, they were busy with the PBOC coin and they are one of the banks that are uh, spearheaded by the CIS the central committee uh, to push this and they were digitizing everything. And so the regulators looked at them and said, okay, you know what? We, we had the president, the CEO of China Construction Bank come to Labuan. We went through their business plan. It's not a walk in the park. Huh? I have to remind you, it's not that simple. Uh, but yeah, we, we were the first regulator in Malaysia to issue a digital banking license for CCB. Since then, we already have four operational, uh, another one in the pipeline, and they are not necessarily all Malaysian. Some are Malaysian. So we all know Lee Kim Yew's got a bank in Labuan. That's an investment, a digital investment bank. We have another investment bank uh, in Labuan that is backed by uh, one of the muni municipalities in China. Um, we have another one that is a part of the Gun Group that started out as a token business. Okay, so this is the interesting thing about Laban. You can issue a token, you can have a payment gateway, you can have a money broking license. So, but it's all very wholesale. Um, and, and, and that is something that I really want to highlight. I don't know if I've answered your entire question. No, no, I think, I think definitely you did, uh, in the sense whereby there is quite a clear demarcation as to Laban's approach. Um, compared to where Bank Nagara is 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 mm. focusing towards at this point in time, and 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 I guess when 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 you look at it and as what Salim actually raised in the in the early start, um, to a certain extent, of course, banking licenses all around the world um, could could be politically driven to a certain extent. Whereby you, you have to weigh upon the the, the stakeholders of the nation and and what's best interest for Malaysia at the end of the day. And and I I always take my hats off um, and and I, I will commend Labuan for being very very progressive. Um, especially in the crypto market, uh, as you mentioned, you had a couple of players who started off with just um, crypto, but but that leads to perhaps a different stream of discussion that we might have in terms of digital identity and FATF's concern in terms of having a passport um, of between crypto and crypto um, VASB players at the end of the day. So so I'll, I'll take that with you. Uh, and pleasure. Maybe we will do a session together uh, in, in that sense. Uh, but coming back to to onshore, coming back to to where we are. Um, I like what Nain shared about consumer profiling and, and, and catering to, to these segments. But I think one, one pain point um, that most perhaps traditional player and, and local regulators and, and certain parties or entrepreneurs are looking at is that the path to profitability. Because central bank seems to impose a, a, a stigma saying that you must cater to the underserved, you must cater to the um, unbanked to a certain extent, right? Of course, that, that spurred the FinTech initiative in the start, right? Parties that are un underserved, unbanked, was, was where FinTech came in and started um, growing rapidly. But this seemed to be a focus segment of, of Malaysia. And maybe, yeah, I can, maybe I can get the views of um, Salim and Main again um, in terms of how, how do we juggle that? You know, because there's the stigma that people will say that, oh, there's a reason why national banks don't go into this space. That's one. Um, the other the other segment would be before digitization, we, we always have this trouble about digital education, which is more important to get the players educated first before you could even introduce a product. Right. And and of course, we're not talking about the, the Gen Z's or the millennials. We're talking about perhaps the, the Gen, Gen X or, or baby, baby boomers who who perhaps look at a screen and freeze because they don't really know what to click at the end of the day. Yeah. So. Yeah, some thought from you guys. Yeah, for sure. But I, I just before before I go there and answer your question, Jonathan, I just want to comment on, on Farah's point. And, and I think that's extremely relevant when you talk about the, the different approach of regulators. Like there are multiple revenue pools and the revenue pools globally around wholesale and perhaps, you know, dare I say fringe are actually slightly a lot a lot more lucrative and a lot more interesting. And if if the right players can and the, with the right regulatory support, th those kind of constructs can be created. You actually have a very winning solution. And actually, I think you touched on it. They're two very different purposes. And, and I think it's actually really good to see that, you know, you know, us near shore uh, or limit shore and, and, and kind of onshore having having those different solutions can actually together help Malaysia be uh, quite a, a strong player in Southeast Asia over the next, you know, 10, 20 years as opposed to just the next three years, right? So 
I just just that's a comment on that, and it's and, it, and it's not lost, and it should not be lost on fintechs the value of, of having those different licenses. Um, that's the first point. The, the second point, to answer your question, <laughs> there, there there is a balance, right? Like um, I think it, it's it's all okay. The 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 official answer is well, banks have old sticky unit economics and they you know you you, you can you can put a, a, a you can change you can put a wrapper around something but if the underlying you know i was in the wrapper was in the box is still you know garbage um unfortunately it's uh it's just creating you know noise and it's just a pretty picture now i think that what the whole premise of fintech so i don't look this you know there's, there's 31 people i doubt there's any bankers on this course so i can be a bit more open um, <laughs> apart from the panelists, of course, right? Like, I mean, I don't think there's anyone else. <laughs> so I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, when it comes down to it, like, I think the, the fintechs, the core premise of, of, of tech and fintech, whatever way you look at it, and, and like the only way you win in this industry is that if you can leverage your tech to do two fundamental things. And I really believe that if you don't have this as a fintech, you're not really a fintech. The first thing is leverage your tech to actually change, the, actually three things. One, change, leverage your tech to change the way you, you run your processes from the very core, your operating costs. So then your, your, your cost acquisition to a lifetime value, your CAC to LTV, actually makes more sense to go and target different segments, right? That's the first thing. And I think that's important to say because, you know, ultimately, you know, when, whether you, you max out your tier one, you know, capital allocation, going to tier two capital allocation, there's going to be segments at which that, that kind of optimization curve changes. Yes, you can still make money, but it's not going to be as much money. So why would I allocate my capital to where I make less money? And that's typically as you go down to different segments, right? So, and, and if you look at the consolidated capitals of banks, they often have a say of which, you know, how much money that you're making and they're dividend based. You know, if you look at most shareholders, you know, they're looking for dividends. So typically this is how banks behave and it all comes from one, from one place. Um, the idea of fintechs having lower up in costs, as so the theory goes, allows us to be able to act in, to, to kind of to sustainably target the different segments of the of the population and still make money right and where the banks can't play the next thing is using the same to, i think towards the main's point is like using the, the getting that risk understanding your risk and using the data to really and this is proven but it's it's it but there's still a lot of unproven side to this right i just want to highlight this it depends on the data you actually have and the segments that you're actually go like it's not a a crystal ball into whether your, your, your risk losses are going to go up like that. I just want to highlight that. And, and every banker loves to say, yeah, but you know what, like, you know, it's all behavioral is all theory. And it's like, well, actually, no, it's not um, a theory, but it's also only proven on certain segments. And, and if you can really like understand your customer properly. So that's the second pillar of interest. The third thing is culture, right? You know, I, I won't name the bank, but we were getting an NDA done and it took me an NDA, right? A month and a half because uh, I had to go through compliance checks and um, I don't know what to say like I mean uh, I, don't, I, just don't know. I mean that, that, that should that should give you the story about culture right and, and, and the kind of and I'm not saying there has to be a balance between the, the the light regulations that perhaps a lot of fintechs have and going into a full bank and how that's operationalized there's got to be some level and that's why the compliance officer that you hire is going to be the best investment you ever make if you hire the right one uh, it'll enable you to it's an enabler if you don't it's a hindrance um, and I think that's I think that's an important point to make. All, all, all to say, in summary, there is margin to be made. There are sustainable business models, but you have to be very intentional about what you're going to do and how you're going to monetize. And I'll stop there. Jonathan, can I just say something to what Salim was talking about? And I think there there is there is this space that's missing, right? In proportionality in regulations, right? And I think a lot of regulators, you know. It's great to have the bells and whistles of everything, but that's not how this business is going to morph. And when I say business, I don't mean the fintech or digital business. I'm talking about financial intermediation. It is the last piece of this entire digitalization of the world that we live in. You know, I mean, the food panda guys and the grab guys have been doing it forever, right? We are like, financial services is like the last bit that is resisting. And what's important to understand is that there is a middle ground. You know, regulators need to understand there's a middle ground first. Players need to appreciate 
that there has to be regulation. So when we first started this uh, journey, I would call it, nobody wanted to be regulated. Everyone was like, oh, you know, I need to be licensed. No, I, I don't need like, when I go to Seychelles or whatever. Fine, go. Now everyone's like, can I have a license, please? And yes, this is, I will expose myself to you. And, you know, there is a maturity uh, that I've seen in the last three, four years in this space. I think there has to be a, an evolution. I wouldn't say maturity, but an evolution with regards to the regulators. And like everything else in life, there has to be a middle ground and a coming together. Um, and that's the only way this will work. Because if not, the fintechs might take over the banks or the banks might take over the fintechs. And that isn't necessarily good for the consumer. Yeah, um, so John, maybe i uh, ask one last, add one last part to this. So yes, the, the standard answer is digital banks will operate 30, 50% lower cost than traditional banks. We don't have retail, we don't have physical footprint, so we should operate really agile. We just need a small team to go forward. Um, so efficiency, like Salim mentioned, it's right on the spot, it's there. Um, however, um, we're looking at the long tail, right, of Malaysia. 80, 90% of that underserved, underpenetrated segment. Um, there is volume, the volume, so attacking the volume could get us to the path to profitability. There are digital banks out there outside of Malaysia uh, that is profitable within three to five years. So the use cases are there. Um, so one might argue, yeah, because it's they're in China, right? Look at the show volume of people in China, that's how they get profitable. Um, but actually the the answer wasn't in the, in that because China is big enough um, to get their volume. It's because China, uh, the digital banks outside of Malaysia and China, they didn't start from a bank perspective. They started from e-commerce, right? They, the long tail was e-commerce. It was the youth who first get their first job and their salary paycheck. It was that niche use cases that they targeted that brought the volume in. Um, so I think if um, coming back to that point, right? So if we are able to target the volume of Malaysia, we'll be able to get profitability. Then your last question would be, but that volume, it's huge risk for Malaysia, right? Banks don't touch them for a purpose, you said, right? So why, why FinTech, why Digital Bank? Um, so I think just to sum it up, it is in what Salim said, it is using parameters that the bank don't understand to reduce that risk. There is learning in AI models, in machine learning models that we've seen out there. We have talked to uh, AI engine uh, vendor providers that tell us banks are looking at data a year ago, right? Yeah. Okay, apologies to bank people in this. <laughs> in this group, but banks are looking okay. at past data that could be inaccurately profiling these users and therefore are still seeing them as risky profiles. Yeah. But actually, if you look in into what they really want, that small working capital, there are clusters of customers that need serving. And if we are able to get that working capital fast enough to make them ensure that they grow and scale, that 80% of Malaysia will then grow and scale. They will demand more services. They will buy more. They will scale more, right? And when they grow, the individuals grow because SMEs are individuals as well, right? It's the mom, mom and pop shop. It's the hawker. Right. It's our day to day. It's our Malay segment, right? So, um, so I, that's um, what we need to do. Like Salim say, balance risk and relevance um, of of Malaysians, but use use our brains, you know, tap our brains together to to find out the perfect uh, way to manage this um, um, ecosystem. Right, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, come, thanks, thanks, guys. And, and I think coming to Farah's point, and, and, and I think we've always been bouncing on this, and, and to a large extent, I completely concur, because in, in any event, when it comes to technology, when it comes to digital, innovation has to always run faster than regulation, right? That, that's always the maxim that, that we hold on to. Um, but there needs to come a point whereby regulation comes in because then it would safeguard um, muscling up by, by other more dominant or, or, or more uh, high liquidity players that could, that could just cannibalize other players who are just starting out at the end of the day. And, and, and that's the whole purpose of, of regulation to a very large extent. Um, and and on, that, on, on that note itself, yeah, I, I hear uh, both Salim and I hear uh, Mayin as well in terms of, of having a very consumer-centric um, 
behavioral centric kind of approach and taking taking into account like China. Uh, but but one one little stigma I, I do share um, is that if we look at the China demographic, that the China demographic actually skipped the credit card era when they, when it st first started opening up, right? We we are very happy with our little you know uh, what three inches by you know four inches uh, tabbing little card that we run around plastics and all. Uh, but China skipped the whole entire era, and 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 because I, I guess when they first started out, Union Pay was was just not sizable enough to support the entire um, China market, and and that came about the QR codes and, and that came about e-commerce and perhaps yes i agree um you have players like kakao bank in, in south korea that that is thriving uh, really well just by deposit taking and a very limited um centric kind of kind of approach but but the, the thing here is that as both of you shared and, and, and as um, both of you were, were sharing about the requirements of, of depending on, on technology um perhaps let me use uh, lack of a better phrase an ai or machine learning algorithm that that picks up trend um that part of it is very determinant on the metadata installer right the, the algorithm is set by by you guys in, in that sense and, and that leads to the next question as to if that is so um are there sufficient safeguards what what, what do you see as an issue to ensure that risk profiling can be minimized um trending because if, if i hear it correctly I, I think traditional banks won't go into the digital banking space because it takes too much manpower there are a bunch of institution today um and digital banks perhaps i would say that will be best run by family offices or, or young startups which is willing to go down to the ground and, and understand the behavioral patterns of, of the consumer at the end of the day to, to scale right so in, in in that context itself um of course we are arguing when it comes to virtual assets when it comes to traveling passports um, digital identity and things like that. What about digital banking space? If we're looking at the SMEs, the Machikia and, and, and the mom and pops, right? Um, what happens? Uh, as a lawyer, I'll look at it, oh, bankrupt an individual, we have raised the ban to RM50,000. But we're talking about micro lending, right? The 5,000, the 1,000 ringgit. The recourse is, is so, it's it's almost negligible. And to hire counsel, even though I'm in the profession, it's it's not worthwhile hiring us, you know. And even even if you give me like a, a thousand files to do, it's still not worthwhile for entrepreneurs or digital banking uh, players to, to go and retrieve these funds. So, so how do we balance? What are the safeguards that you guys think is, is important um, to to be implemented in that sense? You've raised so many points, Jonathan, in that, 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 that five minutes. I just want to start off by the first thing. Saying I don't think regulators are, are and I'm sorry for in advance, that are thinking to block the reason for regulation is to block tech giants coming in. By by no means do I think that's it. I think it's to I think it's to save consumers. And actually, in some cases, it's like it's been to the advantage of of uh, of large tech players and tech titans coming into the financial uh, financial space. Um, I mean, we're seeing it evolve in Southeast Asia. I mean, the award of Group having a license. I mean, that must have really pissed off DBS, right? But 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 you know, all to say, uh, I mean, all to say. That, that you saw that with PSD2, uh, you know, with the ECB, you saw that you saw that with the with the replica of PSD2 and with the FCA and the SAR payments, the payment systems regulator, um, you know. So I, I don't I don't think it's there. To, I think it's probably, you know that's a nice story, uh, and I, I don't believe you, Jonathan. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I wish I wish that was the case. Uh, but I do think it should, we should help young entrepreneurs and other companies. No, no, Salim, I didn't say that the regulators are using it against the fintech. I'm saying the regulators are accustomed to a certain level of ultimate regulation. I agree on your point. I'm talking, Which, I'm talking about Jonathan's point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay. yeah. I, agree on, I agree with your point. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that makes sense. To your point on, on having a level of even playing field actually just enhances the whole industry because it means that you can actually mm. trade globally. You can actually create the solutions that you need to do without having corresponding you know blacklisting your entire jurisdiction but anyway that's a, that's a, I'm, that's going a back. Yeah. I'm going back to questions we're not going to go there sorry <laughs> um no so so, so 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 all to say um i think that you know banks you know i i think you know as a may you mentioned a lot of points around embedded finance um and and contextualization of finance and distribution of finance and you get a lot of different data so i mean it Jonathan, if I, if I repeat your question, you're saying, is there 
a way to use this tech? Is there a right? Is there a balance between using all data, all information possible, and being able to you know manage your ultimate risk on the other side of it? Right? If I understood correctly, let me tell you a story about uh, about, about a Kazaki bank. Just just down for just one second, right? Um, there was a there's a Kazaki bank run by Georgians, and it won't take you long to figure out who this bank is. And um, it was like the, the number 20 bank in Kazakhstan, believe it or not. Yes, Kazakhstan has 20 banks. And um, they, they bought the bank and they, 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 they changed it around, turned it around, and they turned it into a white goods lender. But to be able to get a fridge, you had to put down the names of four people in your community that would vouch for you. And that data, uh, I mean, this is one, one extreme, and, and, and they would capture all the data on all these people and by, by giving them access, they have to download the app, they have to give access and kind of authorize it. And then they would start ringing them if you didn't, you know, if you didn't pay and, and that community shame, right? So those things, that end of the spectrum need to be regulated. Having said that, on the other side of it, I would say as much data as can be used and can be given by a, uh, you know, uh, can be gathered by a financial institution by whatever means fit but within the GDR or PDPA uh, data regulations um, should be allowed because ultimately that's how you level the playing field, right? And, and use all the the cool tech that Mayan is talking about. Yeah. So, John, I think it's um, so. Of course, there are a lot of data that um, that these uh, individuals or SMEs are leaving um, uh, traces behind. Um, a lot of it, uh, when we look at, say, example of a credit facility, we're not, um, we're doing, we're inferencing the data, right? So we're we are learning along the way, we're forming insights based on this raw data um, that we've collected. So basic information, but understanding from their usage, behavior, and data um, to come up with our own insights and prediction. So we're not really taking um, your bank account statement, crawling through all that to come up with a credit facility for you. We're not doing that. We are looking at pieces of data. We are forming um, guide, guided or uh, uh, intelligent um, insights from yours and, and offering them an offer, to, uh, giving you an offer uh, that meet, we think meet your needs. Um, if you accept the offer, and you thrive, and we see uh, we see improvements from that offer. Then we use that inference to target another one, another cluster, and so on and so forth. So uh, we don't believe in using a lot of PDPA data. The PDPA data is uh, sometimes required because you're a bank, right? So we still need to go through certain collaterals. Um, but it's it's a smart it's a smarter way of um, doing inference of that data, and that's why they. AI and machine learning, like we said, it is the core of it, right? So, um, so that's my my take of it. We we do hope uh, Bank Nagara cut fintech some slack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that goes to Farah's point. I know, of having a uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we 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 are fintechs are compliant. We yes. submit a lot of papers. We test the apps in and out. KYC, we comply to the framework. We submit yeah. to Bank Gara. Um, uh, move a little bit faster for us is what I'll ask of Bank Gara uh, so that we can help the underserved segments of Malaysians more. Uh, we, we promise to be good boys and be compliant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we keep ourselves in check because, uh, to be honest, we are holding people's money. Mm. Uh, uh, and if, we, if there are anything bad that happens, uh, the people that are unforgiving, it's not just the recent regulation, right? We yeah. market itself will we'll never forgive you for the mistakes you make. So we're very careful there, right? Um, so that's... Uh, that, that's uh, but, but May and you, you know, I think a couple of years ago, so Jaime took over the, the, the mantle in the garden. He's, he's a great guy to have on your side yeah. within the bank. I mean, yeah, yeah you know, and, and, and I'm sure, you know, he's doing all he can to kind of yeah. it's it's just because it's jurisdictionally bound all right, all right. Uh, yeah that, that is the limitation and you know from a regulatory point of view i think the market needs to understand that there there is an in there is rightly well rightly actually there is a check and balance globally within jurisdictions 
yeah. and jurisdictions can parry us very quickly. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's why having a, a jurisdiction like Malaysia, like Salim was talking about, you so you have your onshore Nagara uh, with Sahaimi, you know, pushing the, the, the mantle for you there. And then you have Labuan as sure. You actually have a bit of everything yeah. um, that that bodes very, very well for 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 the startups and the fintechs. The the issue with data is something that we struggle with as a regulator, as, as someone that brings a potential licensee, the regulator, um, is something we struggle with. It's not a Malaysian issue necessarily. And it's definitely not based on PDPA or GDPR. Yeah. It's very much about behavior. Um, and really it is also about context. Because when you look at inclusion and you look at really reaching out, and I'm not going to talk about banking, I'm talking about InsurTech, um, for example. So we've got a potential InsurTech that's doing um, quick payouts for catastrophe losses in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So the moment there's a flood, these rice farmers are going to get $100, which is for them a huge amount. Huh? Now, in order to get to the, to the data, these guys that are being funded by the Japanese or the World Bank Japanese subsection of the, you know, they have to go and put in a collect a, a info, a rainwater collector thing, right? And this is a very interesting story. It's worth your while. So then they need to collect the data in order to come up with a risk profile, you know, embed it into the system in order to then issue out the cover in order to understand the risk. Blah. Now, what do these farmers do? They look at this collector and they think, oh my God, it's raining. This collector is going to get spoiled. We'll cover it. This is fundamentally an example of the challenges in collecting data that we know for a fact is happening with one of our potential license holders. Yeah. You know, and it's not GDPR. It is, it is the confluence of data and the underserved and, and that has to somehow come together, if that makes any sense, yeah. for this to really work. So, yeah, so I, I guess part of the point that you're making and, and that very similar point that main ways, um, just that traditional bank possibly have lots of historical data, right? And and the comfort they take from historical data is the fact that historical data, the, the, the little hiccups, the little mistakes that they've, they've seen, they've overcome. And, and it's best to keep ourselves in this safe zone of depending on historic, historical data. Test and proven to a certain extent. Whereas now, when we're looking, when we are looking at the digitization space or digitalization space, we are looking at behavioral, we're looking at uh, profiling, we're looking at trending, right? Which, which I think at, at our conversation as Alan is that, that these it's not that they are not proven, but they are very they are very um, segment centric uh, where where it is proven at the end of the day as to how profitable or how how well it's being done. Um, but I would like to take the approach that. As, as shared with everybody in a sense whereby. As we look at Malaysia, we are a entrepreneurial centric um, nation. Yeah, very, very, very different from our, our closest neighbor. Yeah, they're very institutionalized at the end of the day, right? In, in, in Malaysia, we, we have lots of young entrepreneurs and, and without having a product that allows them to overcome incorporating a company that needs to be running for one year before you can get, start getting a loan, um, you must perhaps mortgage your first bond before you can get a hundred thousand from the bank you know overcoming these kind of hurdles perhaps would be the room where digital banking would, would start coming in to, to to meet and and that perhaps would be um the way to increase um in terms of uh, in, in increase i guess malaysia to, to a higher salary bracket or high income um bracket nation at the end of the day um so i guess we've got a Another two minutes or so. Any closing thoughts from anyone? I actually got a question from the floor, but I'm not sure if Main you want to answer this. Yeah, it's it's, quite it's an low interesting question, Main. Yeah. So 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 to Dave Chu. Yeah, if if, if uh, Main is caught up with an end, then, then I guess you can answer <laughs> this. But anyway, is Green Packet going for digital banking license alone or with a consortium? Yeah, so we'll we'll go with the consortium actually. So, um, so it's a watch and see space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's all I can say for now. But um, we are very excited about um, about this year and next. Um, it's not because we it's not because of the digital bank license only. 
we see movements in fintech finally in Malaysia, landing in Malaysia, health service providers are behind us. I think the ecosystem is moving. Um, people are playing together nicely right now, uh, some somewhat, uh, because we want to move the nation. Um, I hope to work more with um, the other players in the field for at the end of the day. Um, yeah, let's, let's see how far Malaysia can go, and I'm really excited to see the next few years of Nice to meet everyone. Any closing thoughts from Big Bang? Yes, sadly. So, so I think that it will be a very interesting time to see how, what well, one, what consortiums actually end up going for it, um, and the and how Bank Nagara will end up viewing these consortiums. Um, and and um, I think in terms of in terms of the also different uh, you know segments that people, it will be interesting to see how Bank Nagara views the different segments. Is are each are expected to solve? all the problems or are they expected to solve some of the problems i think it's the latter i think most players are going after the latter and i think it'll be very interesting to see the propositions that come out at the end of this and end of 2022 which are and how many of them are i have an ecosystem i can distribute or whether it's going to be something a bit more interesting than that and 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 what we see around i think the commercial space i think jonathan to your point on, on entrepreneurs on on smes as well far like i think those are going to be the really really interesting pieces and especially those that can take that and and, and enable the right financial uh, infrastructure to give SMEs access not only to Malaysian markets and increase the demand uh, increase the supply curves but also across and you know kind of just moving the entire demand curve by allowing financing infrastructure for the region and Malaysia to be at the center of that i think those are going to be really um, going to be a space to watch i think for big pay um, we're very excited about the digital banking license. I think you will hear some announcements about us in the next uh, the next few weeks, and 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 and, and. so we'll we'll, we'll stay tuned. And uh, thank you very much uh, to the panelists and the audience for uh, the time and the attention. Far, anything you want to close with? How can I close with two scoops? Like you know, you've got a scoop from Big Pay, scoop from uh, Gake. Uh, Come to <laughs> No, I mean, you know, we the digital space in Labuan is we're gonna launch we're gonna launch our market report for 2020 in the next month or so. The digital space has had more than 100 percent growth. Um, yeah. I think the thing about Labuan is it's not Malaysian centric; it's regional, if not global. We we enjoy this space. Uh, change is not easy, mm -hmm. um, but we enjoy this space. I on on the domestic front, I'm very curious to see uh, five on the road. Uh, the success of the digital bank under the Nagara license vis-a-vis -vis people who, or players who would prefer to just take a, a, a money license or, you know, I think that is that is where it's going to be interesting to see because I have seen so many FIs, financial institutions, crippled by regulation yeah. when you have that four-letter word, bank, yeah. okay? And a lot of what fintechs want to do, don't that word. Yeah. Right. It, a lot of it is, you know, I think Salim, you said it about earlier when we were having this chat about the PR angle. Oh, it's a bank. It's a bank. But actually, when you come down to it to serve your clients, to get your money in, you don't need a banking license necessarily. OK, so I'm very curious in the next three years to see, you know, because there are certain other players that have been very conscious in not going for this license. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, there is a group of players that I've been talking to as well. Mm -hmm. We'll have another conversation. Yes. Yeah, it's like, no need, uh, can we Labon do like this? And then Malaysia, we do like this, and then we Combo. patch it. <laughs> yeah, we patch it like, like you know, because I'm always talking about my my son's Lego set, right? We patch it like that. We build it. Yeah, absolutely. Do you need the word, the four-letter word? Is the question. That's true. That's true. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Okay, thanks, everyone, for spending a good hour of your sunday afternoon with us and, and really appreciate all the thoughts and insight yeah all the best to uh big pay and uh green packet and kipple as well in, in the upcoming um race to the digital banking license yep exciting times i think everyone this, this is really a lot more positive exciting times than, than us always spending about and i think um yeah, let's, let's just um, keep everybody abreast as to what's going to be happening in the next one yeah thanks everyone